Well, thank you for that wonderful singing, and we'd like to welcome everyone here to church today, and, and also those that watch by way of video. And uh, I have been encouraged this past week again with people putting thumbs up on the Facebook page, which I now know how addictive that is <laughs> uh, when people put stuff on and see how many thumbs up they can get or comments or whatever. And uh, so I appreciate that. However, I hope that thumbs up is because you acknowledge that the Word of God needs to be preached in our churches today. And uh, this past week, having talking to a pastor at another location, uh, one of the, his biggest fears is that uh, pastors will become more political in their uh, preaching and become more uh, focused on issues that are taking place in the communities around us. Uh, they will become more consumed uh, with uh, different things that are taking place and, and stop actually focusing on uh, preaching from the Word of God and, and getting back to the, the text that we have. And uh, so I appreciate that, uh, uh, that comment that was made. And, and also, Father, for a uh, father... <laughs> I, I'm going to pray here in a minute, but, uh, but also just, just, a, just for a great week. Uh, and uh, so let's be in prayer for each other and pray for those who watch us by way of YouTube or by the website or uh, through Facebook. And um, if you'll notice, uh, today's message is a review. And the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, sometimes we forget some of the things that we've learned as we've gone along. And so in this message nine today, I'd like to do a review of the first uh, three chapters of the book of Daniel and, and, uh, and where we've come from. And now, for those that are watching by way of uh, um, Facebook, they can go to the website. And at the website is an actual handout of the, uh, what the congregation receives here in church on Sunday mornings. And you're able to follow along and watch the video and, and, and have the handout as well. Um, but what I'd encourage you to do this morning is we should grab our Bibles because there's a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about, but we're not going to show it on the screen behind me here. And uh, because we're doing just a, a general overview of where we've come from. And at the end of this particular message... Um, what I've done is I've gone back over the last eight messages and found the applications or the bottom lines or the conclusions of each uh, week's message. And I was really uh, taken back by how much uh, we have learned and how much we can apply to our lives as we go along here today. And so uh, the review of the first three chapters of the book of Daniel is what I want to talk about. Uh, one of the first things that we need to understand is that the book of Daniel uh, was written around the 6th century B.C. And the prophecies that we see in the book of Daniel provide tremendous support for the inspiration of Scripture. As a church, uh, we as Trinity Baptist Church Incorporated, as the government would say to me, uh, is a church that believes in the inerrancy of Scripture, that there's no error or emission, uh, there is no, no, nothing in here that is not correct. And thus, we have tremendous support within the book of Daniel for the inspiration of Scripture. The book divides really nicely into two divisions. And that's kind of cool for those of us who are preaching the book of Daniel. And I'm not the only one <laughs> preaching the book of Daniel right now. Um, a pastor friend of mine in Ontario is preaching the book of Daniel. Uh, a gentleman uh, from one of the churches I'm affiliated with and connected with in British Columbia is preaching the book of Daniel. And uh, here I am, uh, preaching the book of Daniel as well. So these different churches are getting different uh, spins on these things. And, and, and so for us as pastors preaching the book of Daniel right now, it's kind of cool how it breaks down into two divisions. And the first division is what is called a narrative. 
That's chapters 1 to 6. What that means is it's more of a conversation, more of a story, uh, giving us an idea and, and, and lots of ways of getting practical application. When we get to chapter 7 to 12, it gets a lot deeper and, uh, and it's harder to uh, preach because it's, as I said in here, deeply mysterious because there's a lot of things in there that we're going to look at that we just don't have, uh, we won't know really the truth until we get the glory. And it's very symbolic in nature. And so I suggest to you that, that, that this book is, is kind of cool. In fact, is that we get the practical, we get the narrative, but then we also get the theological. We get the deeper uh, meanings of the Word of God. And I'm not going to gloss over chapter 7 to 12. We are going to hit it right on, and we are going to swim in there, and we are going to figure it out as best we can and uh, go from there. And in these chapters, Daniel, uh, he reviews four visions in his old age. Because remember, Daniel was... A uh, young, he uh, was a young, he was a young, uh, uh, I would say about 16, 17 years old when he became in captive, and then uh, throughout his years came these visions. And there's four visions in the book, there's four major prophecies. One of the first ones was the one that we just finished talking about, and that's that great image and how King Nebuchadnezzar was trying to get a handle on this dream that he had, and he wanted somebody to interpret that dream to find out what it meant. And so we've talked about that in chapter 2. There's uh, another one we're going to be coming up to uh, as we go along here, chapter 7. It's the four beasts. We're going to talk about that vision, uh, that prophecy. The ram and the male goat we'll find in chapter 8. And uh, the 70 weeks uh, it's a, that, is, that, that is there in, in our uh, 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 in our process here of looking at these four major prophecies. And so uh, those are the uh, uh, breakdown of those things there. Now, let's uh, review now where we're at. But before we do that, I want to open in prayer, and then we will um, get right into this here, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the privilege I have of, of just reviewing the first four books, uh, the first four chapters, I'm sorry, of the book of Daniel. Uh, I thank you, Father, for this series because it's really helped us to solidify in your mind some things about our lives as individuals. And Lord, we'll, I thank you for the applications that we will talk about later. And, but right now, Father, I just ask that you would be honored and glorified by the preaching of the word this morning and, and by us understanding what the uh, uh, book of Daniel, the first three chapters, is all about. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, so if you want to take your Bibles, we're going to just flip through. Okay, so chapter 1. Uh, in the, it begins by telling us that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, King Nebuchadnezzar, captures Jerusalem. That's where Daniel and his three friends are from. There's a bunch of names in there in chapter 1. One of them is Jeho Jehoiakim. And that means Jehovah sets up and obviously Jehovah pulls down as well. Zedekiah is another one we see there in chapter 1, is Jehovah is righteous. And, and now Jehoiakim and Zedekiah were the last two kings of Judah, and it is most apparent that they did not live up to the meaning of their names. And so Daniel, a young prince, along with some others, is carried off to Babylon and faces a great temptation because we see in Daniel chapter 1, 8 and 9 that Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. You see, he wanted to keep the traditions. He wanted to keep the foods that he used to eat. 
And the Lord granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. It's fascinating how even though he was tempted to, to eat this, the king's choice food, he stuck with what he knew and what he thought. And we see in the text that, and we saw in the text that in our own lives we have temptations every day that come along in our lives. Uh, and how Daniel handled that temptation is something that we can apply to our own lives. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And the Lord is faithful, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. You see, in our lives, there will be times where we want to do something that we know we shouldn't be doing. And we really, really struggle with that. But what does it say in the text here? That God is there for us. And he will not allow us to go any farther than we are able to go. You see, we can overcome temptation by the heart. We can overcome temptation by the word. And we can, come, uh, through, uh, we can overcome temptation by prayer. We saw that in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not have found himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. You see, he went and he talked about this. Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word, the Lord's word. With all my heart I have sought you, the psalmist says. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Let your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Matthew 26, 41, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we talked about all this in chapter one. And so in that chapter, we saw how Daniel was being prepared by the Lord to be able to help with this interpretation of this dream. Now, in view of chapter 2, the chapter contains the first of several dreams the king of Babylon had, King Nebuchadnezzar we're talking about here. And the king is furious that his wise men cannot answer the dream and plans to have them all killed. And Daniel steps in and asks for time from the king. He says, Daniel chapter 2, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Um, we are going to help you interpret it. So Daniel tells his three fans about his problem. We saw that in Daniel chapter 2, 17 to 18. Daniel gives him wisdom and revelation from the Lord concerning that dream. And then Daniel praises the Lord in Daniel chapter 2, 20 to 23, and Daniel interprets the king's dream. We see that in 32 to 45 of, of Daniel 2. And then Daniel foretold of a coming kingdom that would last forever and would fill the entire earth with the glory of the Lord. We saw that in Daniel chapter 2, 35, and of course Daniel chapter 2, 44 to 45. And of course in chapter 3 we learn as we, we just learned a couple of weeks ago, that Nebuchadnezzar made a great image of himself to be worshipped. Because after all, he was told that he was going to be the god of the gold. And so Daniel's three friends, because you've got to remember in chapter 3, there's not a lot of talk about Daniel in there. It's all, all about his three friends. The king had said to everyone, if you... When we get together and the trumpet sounds, you were to bow down and worship me. And Daniel's three friends refused to worship this golden image made of King Nebuchadnezzar. And these men are young. They're not old people with a lot of wisdom behind them. These are quite young men. And we need to ask ourselves, and it was one of the questions that we had in chapter 3 of can we or our children resist the pressure of a secular culture? We are constantly bombarded with 
this idea that we need to be you know, um, uh, conforming to the community, conforming, conforming, conforming to the culture around us. We have peer pressure, humanistic education void of God. We have mass media, we have the internet, YouTube, music, you name it, we've got it. And I trust you can say, yes, we can. We can not. We, we, we can get to that place of where we will not conform to the image of the community. However, we need the Lord's grace to do it. We can't do it on our own. We need each other. That is why it's so important that those that are watching by way of video, uh, whatever medium that you're using, that you are supporting a local church, that you are coming, worshiping corporately. It's a biblical mandate. It's not something that is, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a fact, folks. We need to be coming to church. We need to make an effort to come to church. Yes, we're in COVID. Yes, we're in all these things right now. However, churches are open. Churches are saying, come, come and worship with us. Yes, I appreciate the fact that we have videos and we have ways of seeing that, but we also would love to have you come and join us whatever, wherever you are. If you live in the Battlefords area, certainly come and worship with us here physically and, and learn and grow and not just hearing the word of God preached, but in other ways as well. You see, we need to pray for each other. We need to remember that we need to grow together. We need each other. We need the support of each other. We need prayer support. We need physical support. We need godly examples around us so that our family and our children and our friends and our colleagues can see that they don't need to conform to the image of this world in which we live in. And of course, biblical instruction. How important it is for us to be under the word of God on a daily basis through devotions, uh, through uh, understanding um, the word better. Uh, our ladies here at the church are starting today the book of Ephesians. Not just a nice... Uh, uh, oh, what does this verse say? That's for, this is going to be like a seminary-style course where they're going to be going into the deeper things of the book of Ephesians. And I'm excited about that because what is the book of Ephesians all about? It's about the church. And it's about how we can grow and we can come together and we can understand the church more. And thus, may I suggest you in this time in our lives we live in and all the stuff that is going on, that we not be politically correct, but theologically correct in how we look at things, how we interpret, how we go about living our lives, how we go about working through the processes of life, that we look at the text, that we look at the Word of God before we make a decision what does the Word of God tell us we should be doing? What is the Word of God saying about that issue? What does it say? Because in the Word of God, I suggest to you, and this is my personal opinion, that there's not anything in your life, nothing, absolutely nothing, that has not got an answer in this Word. I do believe that with all my heart, that this is our guide, this is our direction, we, if we believe that the Word of God is inspired by God, that there's no error or mission in it, that no matter what is going on in your life, no matter, it doesn't matter what it is, there is an answer here. There is an answer here in the Word. So instead of being politically correct, instead of preaching politics and all these things that become controversial that maybe we should focus on this and what it has to say to us. You see, life is filled with temptation that we must resist. 
And I suggest to you that there are times in our lives where we need to remember these things. Now let's get into the conclusion of what we've learned. Because if you remember in Daniel chapter 3, it finished off with King Nebuchadnezzar being upset at these, these men, these young men, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for not bowing down and worshiping him and conforming to him, and they threw him in the fiery furnace. Even the people that threw him in died, and there they are walking around, none scathed, totally uh, unburnt, nothing. Not even their clothes were burnt. And, and here at the end of chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar says, these guys are to be respected, and these guys are to be that. And that's what we got last week. And so that's where we're at. Daniel chapter 3, verses 22 to 25, uh, we, we have this, this finishing off here of, of how the king's command was... Um, was fulfilled and then these men were found in verse 25 uh, loosed and walking about in the midst of a fire without any harm so that's where we ended up so let's talk about the applications from the first eight messages now this is straight off your handouts and uh, some of these you might remember first of all in daniel chapter 1 verses 1 to 2 it was just an introduction we need to learn to stand alone in a hostile anti-Christian environment. We need to be people who believe what they believe because we believe that the Word of God has what we need to learn and to understand. Thus, we need to submit to God's providences no matter how harsh or hard they seem. So if we look at the Word of God and we see the answer to our question, even though it may seem hard or harsh, we need to respect that because we need to submit to God's providences no matter how harsh or hard they seem. Thirdly, we learn that we need to be encouraged that the Lord is on the throne and will fulfill all of his secret purposes. Remember, if you've heard me in the last few weeks, I said God wins in the end. All this stuff that's going on around us, all this stuff, God wins. God wins. God wins, and so we need to always remember and be encouraged that the Lord is on the throne, and no matter what is going on and how difficult things seem to be, God is fulfilling his purposes, not only for your life, but my life, the church's life, for this world in which we live in. Message two, the application was this. We need to remember that our behavior and moral failures have tremendous impact of the ones we love. When we don't live up to what we should, it has a tremendous impact to the third generation, not just to the immediate, but to the third generation. The need to faithfully teach and instruct our children in the doctrines of our faith in the Lord. We need to understand that we need to un grow in our walk. We need to ask ourselves, can we or our children resist the pressure of a secular culture? You know, they, if you go to the public school, you have humanistic education that is void of God. If you go to the Catholic school system, they have humanistic education and throw God in there as well. And they have this mishmash of stuff going on in the Catholic schools that I find very interesting. One minute there, I remember uh, I was at the, uh, uh, our uh, local Catholic high school for a, a wellness day with my daughter who had a table there. And, and two girls were reading the morning prayer. And all they did was giggle and laugh over the sound system. I was just, I was like, you might as well just t say forget it. Here, let me read it. I mean, it was so, it was, you're supposed to be a, a system of religion, Catholic, it's a Catholic school. 
You're teaching religion. The public schools don't teach religion. Why are you allowing these two girls to giggle and laugh and one even belched? They thought this was the funniest thing. I thought, wow, this is embarrassing. Embarrassing to the school board, embarrassing to the school, embarrassing to the guests. I don't know. We need to ask ourselves, can we or our children resist the pressure of a secular culture? Peer pressure, humanistic education, void of God, mass media, internet. But you see, the Lord's grace is in our lives. We have prayer support. We have godly examples. We need to be godly examples to our children and our families. We have biblical instruction. We talked about that in message two. Message three, Daniel chapter one, eight to 16. Life is filled with temptations that we must resist and we must be aware of. The place to win over temptation is in the heart. And Daniel's resistance to temptation reminds us that someone along the way spent time with Daniel before he was taken away by the Chaldeans and he was learned right from wrong in those days. And thus we should be diligent to continue to teach, to train, to mold, to pray, etc., etc. And Daniel's obedience in this little thing over meat, over the king's food, prepared him to be obedient in the bigger things that he would face later on. For example, the lion's den and, and his, his friends, the fiery furnace. You see, as Daniel... I see Daniel as a testimony of one who showed incredible heroic Christian character and how he handles himself as a child of the Lord. No matter what was going on, he stayed steady. And I suggest you, and this is what we learned in message three, that a heroic example of Christian character is when people get out of bed every morning and resolve to pray, they resolve to walk with the Lord, they resolve to witness to people about the Lord, they are Christ-like and caring and practice the presence of Christ. They will witness to people about the Lord. They will be Christ-like and caring. And they'll display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And Daniel was the kind of person that we certainly could say that he got up every morning with the courage to purpose in his heart that he would obey the Lord. That was a great message. I remember that one. I was just catching myself there thinking about that message. Message four was Daniel chapter 1, 17 to 21, and we notice the sovereignty of God. We see the sovereign power of the Lord, and we needed to remember that we need to fear the Lord. The Lord, we needed to remember that the Lord honors those who honor him. And in the text, we saw that Daniel lived to see the Lord's times. We saw him fulfilled. The scriptures show us, and it is clear that we need to trust the Lord more and rest in the fact that what is happening today happened before, and at the end of the day, the Lord's sovereign plan is revealed and fulfilled. In other words, I'm saying whatever's going on today, historically, it's just a revolving door. This is, it, God has a plan. God will get us through. And thus, um, we need to rest in the Lord. And uh, yeah, uh, message four. My, uh, my laptop here is really jumping all over the place. Let me just uh, move ahead here. Message five, I suggest to you that only the Lord could give this knowledge and ability to the king, not any outside source. We saw that. We need, we need people of purpose and people of prayer. We, whatever's going on in our lives, we need to start with prayer and seek godly wisdom. And uh, that was message five. Message six, is, this is what I was talking about, is that history repeats itself and thus what is going on today is no different than before. It may have different words, it may be a different spin, but it is the same thing. That What we are going through today has been before, has been before us. We should not be shocked and surprised by where the world is today. 
because it is history repeating itself over again just in a different way. Thus, we need to trust the Lord in the good and the bad times. The scripture shows us and is clear that we need to trust the Lord more and rest in the fact that what is happening today happened before and at the end of the day, the Lord's sovereign plan is revealed and fulfilled. We need to rest in the finished work of Christ and not get all worked up about what is now and what is to come. We're to rest in the Lord today. Message 7 was Daniel 2, 36 of 45. And I asked the question, are you worried about the future? Worried about tomorrow? In a troubled world where truth is often trampled under the feet of dishonest and ungodly people, we sometimes, I said, feel trampled under the feet of discouragement. We can take great comfort to remember who is in control. The Lord is in control. Not you, not me, not the government, not this world, the Lord, not anything you think is in control. Nothing. The Lord is sovereign. He is sovereign. Remember that. He is in control. As hard as we find it is, the Lord has a plan for everything that goes on in your life. Whatever's going on in this world, it's God's sovereign plan to reach people, to speak to people about how they are. We need to take courage in that. In the end, as I've said, the Lord wins. The high king of heaven will prevail at last. And our message last week, Daniel chapter 2, and and went into chapter 3. The main focus should not be on the fiery furnace miracle that took place for the three young men but on the uncompromising courage of these three men to be willing to die for what they believed. That's what we should be focused on. Secondly, I suggest you that we should be all remember that there will always be conflicts. We should all remember that there are always conflicts and crosses that we will face and carry in life. We live in a sinful world. There is going to be conflict. There is going to be crosses that we'll, we will face and carry. And in our lives, there will always be pressure from the world to worship its idols. And if we refuse, the world will always have its own fiery furnace. (laughs) Doesn't matter what it is. And how we handle that is interesting. The fiery furnace may be ridicule. It may be persecution. It may be scorn and contempt for what we believe. It may be ostracization. You know, in church life right now, we have ostracization taking place. Vaccinated versus non-vaccinated. And as I've said in this church, and I've said on videos, and I've said in our website, if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, come anyways. We are not going to separate you because that's not our place. We are here to be loved, to be encouraged. We are not going to ostracize people. Some churches are ostracizing people. How do they do that in light of Scripture? I don't know. You see, our encouragement should be that the Lord is always no matter what is going on in our life, in that furnace with us. 
The Lord will loose us from the bondage. Walk with us even while the trials and afflictions burn away like a fiery furnace. And as I said in previous message, messages, and I'll say it again, history always repeats itself. And through the centuries, the Lord's people have had unusual comfort from the presence of the Lord in times of persecution. I suggest to you that we should lay hold of the fact that we are God's people, God has a plan, and let us remember that it'll all work out in the end for God's glory, not man's. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the privilege I've had of, of sharing the um, review of these messages that uh, has taken place in the last uh, eight weeks. And, uh, Lord, I, I trust that it made sense. I, I love technology, but I also don't like technology. Um, but Father, there was a reason why you made this thing skip around a bit. I know it. Because for every thing that goes on, we know that you have a plan for that. And I pray, Father, that those who are listening by way of video uh, through YouTube, Facebook, or website that, Father, that you would speak to their hearts. For the people that are here, that, Father, there's something that I said here this morning that I am sure can help them apply to their lives and help them to rest in you. Father, these are weird times that we're living in. We're getting conflicting information all the time. And, and uh, I just pray, Father, that we will understand that historic... Histor historically this has happened before it will happen again but at the end father you are sovereign you are the winner and so father we just pray that we will rest we will rest in what you have done for us here on the cross your shed blood rose again sitting at the right hand of the father interceding on behalf of us that father that your word is to be recognized and confirmed as being truth. And so, Father, I come to you today asking that you'd help every one of us that are watching this today, either live or by video, that, Father, that our lives would reflect the love of Christ, that our lives would reflect a love for everyone. And thank you, Father, for the book of Daniel, what it's taught us so far and what it will continue to teach us. What an exciting time we live in. These are awesome days, and I thank you for that. And I just ask now that you would take this message, and uh, Father, it is all yours. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.